Every rejection, every disappointment has led you here to this moment. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from the Y, and today we're gonna be taking a look at everything everywhere all at once. In my book, this was by far the best film of 2022, and the evidence seems to agree, as is currently regarded to be the most awarded film of all time. Just look at how many damn things it won. I didn't even know that many awards existed, to be honest. And it's easy to see why the movies garnered so much acclaim. People love a good comeback story. It gave a fresh take on the multiverse concept, and overall was such a heartwarming story that everyone could get behind. So without further ado, here it is, 30 facts you didn't know about everything everywhere all at once. In early drafts of Everything Everywhere All at Once, co-directors Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, collectively known as the Daniels, thought about having undiagnosed ADHD as the method by which Evelyn could tap into alternate universes. To assess its viability, Kwan scoured the internet to learn everything he could about the disorder, and in the process, discovered something life-changing. He himself had undiagnosed ADHD. He admitted, in case you can't tell when you watch the movie. But all jokes aside, Quan found the diagnosis to actually be a transformative experience. And looking back now, he cites the disorder as a major factor behind why he felt compelled to include topics such as depression and suicide in both Swiss Army Man and Everything Everywhere all at once. It wasn't to destroy everything. It was to destroy myself. As you can imagine, Evelyn staring into the bagel and the quick montage that ensued was the perfect place to hide a number of easter eggs. And possibly the craziest shot they were able to sneak in there was a frame of the VFX editors on a zoom call editing the film itself. When discussing who they wanted in the main role, the Daniels had this thought action movie going to star a dude, which to be honest is par for the course, as I can probably think of 10 action films with a male lead for every one with a female. Going off this, the Daniels had one person in mind, Jackie Chan. However, due to scheduling conflicts, he was unable to accept the offer. It was at this point that the Daniels had a change of heart. They realized that the story worked way better with the female star, as it just made the whole husband-wife duo much more relatable. And the only woman they ever really seriously considered was Michelle Yeoh, even going so far as to say, if she says no, maybe the movie dies. And funny enough, after the success of Everything Everywhere all at once, Jackie Chan sent a message to Yo that read, Congratulations, you know your boys came to see me first. Because the Daniels and Daniel Radcliffe had previously worked together on Swiss Army Man, they asked him to be a part of Everything Everywhere all at once. Unfortunately, he was doing a play at the time, so he was forced to decline. Though he did say, They are probably the only people in the world that I would say yes to doing a movie of theirs without even seeing the script. So I think it's fair to say that we'll probably be seeing another collaboration between them sometime in the future. In the opening scene, you can see that there's a raccoon figurine next to the mirror, obviously foreshadowing Rakakuni. Rakakuni taught me so much! After watching the film, there's no doubt in my mind that the Oscar was well deserved for Jamie Lee Curtis's portrayal of the anal IRS officer. But besides the performance itself, I feel like her outfit also deserves some kind of award because it fit her character so damn perfectly. So it should come as no surprise that it was based on the actual photo of IRS worker Kathleen Malone taken all the way back in 2005. Taken right now. Got to Mrs. Wang. Hello. Following the release of Swiss Army Man, the Daniels were unhappy with the post-production work done in the visual effects department. Their issue was that the whole process felt very impersonal, as all of it was done out of house, meaning they weren't able to give any input or fix any mistakes. So for everything everywhere all at once, they decided to shake things up and instead hired their friend Zach Stoltz to coordinate all the visual effects work. He went on to form a small group of only five people. And here's the crazy bit, none of them had any formal VFX training. All in all, the unlikely team of VFX amateurs completed over 80% of the film's visual effects, resulting in a highly stylized look very much akin to 80s films. During the montage, another frame that flashes on the screen is a reference to the movie itself in the form of a YouTube video. This film marked the first time in over 20 years that Ki Hoi Kwan was cast in a major role. Because it had been such a long time since he had acted in any sort of capacity, Kwan hired both a dialogue coach to help him with his lines. It's the only thing I do know. 
is that we have to be kind. And also a movement coach to help him distinguish which Wayman is on the screen at any given time. In order to achieve this, the coach had him pick out unique animals that matched the personalities of his alternate versions. For regular Wayman, they chose a squirrel. CEO Wayman was a fox. And Alpha Wayman was akin to an eagle. Deciding to cash in on the popularity of the film, A24 released a line of merch which included hot dog finger gloves, a pet rock, googly eyes, and the fan favorite Auditor of the Month trophy candle, which just has such a pleasing design. No wonder it's currently sold out. No doubt a big theme present throughout the entire film is division and strife within a family unit. And a subtle way they were able to portray this has to do with the specific language they each use. When Evelyn talks with her father, she speaks in Cantonese, though when her and Wayman speak, it's in Mandarin, illustrating the disconnect between her upbringing and her life thereafter. And then whenever she talks to Joy in Mandarin, Joy mostly answers back in English and broken Chinese. One of the timelines of course features Evelyn as a famous actress, much like Michelle Yeoh in real life. Because of this, the filmmakers employed a somewhat unusual tactic and reused actual footage from the red carpet premiere of Crazy Rich Asians. The idea for the movie came about all the way back in 2010, after the Daniels were introduced to the concept of modal realism in the film Sherman's March. In layman's terms, modal realism is the view that all possible worlds are real in the same way as the actual world. There was just one problem with the concept though. As the years progressed, their seemingly novel idea began to pop up all over different movies and TV shows. Upon seeing the multiverse in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, their reaction was simply, oh shit, everyone's going to beat us to this thing we've been working on. And Quan even had to stop watching Rick and Morty after they too employed the idea before them. I got bored one day and I put everything on a bagel. In the movie, the everything bagel is a symbol of nihilism and that life itself is utterly meaningless. By design, the bagel is a black ring surrounding a white circle, which makes the googly eyes its opposite, as is notably a white ring surrounding a black circle. This dichotomy holds true to the googly eyes meaning as well, as it represents existentialism, or the belief that it's up to us to create our own meaning. I sort of see it like this. In both the bagel and the googly eyes, the black represents the intrinsic emptiness of the world, and the white symbolizes the meaning we each construct ourselves through whatever means. And with the bagel, the void of the world wins out, while with the googly eyes, the value that we ourselves give to the world is victorious. The last reference I could find concerning the montage takes place with Evelyn in a red room, but it's not just any red room. As you can clearly see, it's in fact a callback to the red room from the show Twin Peaks. According to the Daniels, there were a number of films that inspired them during the making of Everything Everywhere all at once. An obvious one is Ratatouille. I think no further explanation is needed there. A more obscure influence can be seen with the 2D anime Mind Game. The Daniels were drawn to the chaos of it all, and the 5 minute montage of random life experiences definitely shaped parts of their film as well. Then you have 2001 A Space Odyssey. Obviously with the monkeys, but looking at the monolith, I think a lot of parallels can be drawn between it and the everything bagel. Finally, the Daniel said, The movie is 100% a response to the Matrix. We wanted to make our own version of it. Daniel Kwan said this was his personal favorite easter egg. As you can hear, the sound of her pinky uppercutting the dude into orbit was taken from none other than the baseball bat in Super Smash Bros. <laughs> it's honestly so damn satisfying, I'm gonna make you listen to it one more time. To keep the plot of the film under wraps, the working title was A Woman Who Tries to Do Her Taxes. I cannot talk about it. Unless you can help me with my taxes. <sighs> I'm sure if you looked, there's bagel references everywhere. I mean, it's basically just a black circle, so how many of those can you find? But one clear reference to the bagel takes place right before we're introduced to Joy. One of the more unexpected cameos came in the form of the two guys who, for lack of a better term, stick things up their ass. They were in fact Andy and Brian Le, two brothers who run the popular YouTube channel Marshall Club. 
Besides Wayman Wang, there was yet another Wayman present in the film, and that was Wayman Lee, an actor best known for his role in Workaholics, who made an appearance next to Evelyn in the movie theater. Amid the clusterfuck of different universes and fragmented realities, the rock scene was a very much needed breath of fresh air. To say that the scene was ballsy would be an understatement. There's no dialogue, no sound even, just two rocks and subtitles. But it wasn't always gonna be that way. The Daniels said they were always second guessing if they could really pull off such an unconventional sequence and if the audience would actually buy into it. And that feeling lasted all the way till Michelle Yeoh smacked some sense into them. It needs no dialogue, she said. It's a zen garden. If you can remember, Evelyn had this to say about Joy's tattoo. You got a tattoo, and I don't care. If it's supposed to represent our family, you know I hate tattoos. Now, unless you're familiar with Chinese characters, you likely have no clue why a pig is supposed to represent family. Well, it's due to the fact that this symbol right here, which signifies home, is made up of the symbol for roof and the symbol that represents pig. Also, Wayman carries around a little pig plushie on his fanny pack. For Michelle Yeoh, Everything Everywhere All at Once was a film like no other. She explained, I was suddenly doing comedy, physical comedy, action, horror, every single genre all packed into one. I've waited a long time to receive a script like that. Finally, someone understood that I can do all these things. Although we were shown all kinds of strange alternate universes, there was one wacky timeline that ultimately got left on the cutting room floor. The deleted scene featured Evelyn as a sentient piece of spaghetti that comes into contact with an elbow macaroni noodle. The noodle goes on to call her mama and talks about throwing day where the noodles get stuck to the side of the walk and finally become men. So yeah, out of all the weird ass timelines, I think this would have taken the cake. In terms of cameos, the Daniels both appeared multiple times in the film. Daniel Kwan first shows up as the mugger who tries to steal Evelyn's purse, and then later as the first person to get sucked into the bagel. On the other hand, Daniel Scheinert is the guy into the kinky sex stuff, and he's additionally the hot dog fingered ape killing the normal ape. So I know I'm not alone in this. Do you remember being a kid in class and someone says, hey, look at this man, and then shows you their calculator which they made to say boobs? Good times. Well, Everything Everywhere all at once put their own spin on that classic middle school joke. As you can see, in this scene, the calculator reads boobless. Amazingly, they only spent around $14 million to make the movie. Putting that in perspective, when you compare that to something like Guardians of the Galaxy 3, which cost $250 million, Everything Everywhere's budget doesn't even cover Chris Pratt's salary. And because the film earned over 140 million worldwide, it easily became A24's most profitable and highest grossing property to date. Part of the intrigue of Everything Everywhere all at once was just how unique the film as a whole felt. Well, I guess a better way to describe it would be untraditional. And the reason I say this has to do with the way the plot is structured. In most films, conflict is the driving narrative that pushes the storyline along. First, there's an intro which introduces a conflict. Next, the plot builds to the climax, and finally, there's a return home, aka the hero's journey or basic storytelling in Western society, right? Well, because everything everywhere was heavily influenced by East Asian culture, the plot of the film followed along with a time-old Asian narrative called Kishon Tenketsu, also known as the four-part story. Kishon Tenketsu consists of key or the introduction, show or plot development, ten which is akin to the twist, and the conclusion or ketsu. Although this might sound familiar to the hero's journey, the major difference is that conflict is not the driving narrative. Sure, there usually is conflict in Kishan Tenketsu, but the driving force behind the story is the characters and the changes they make and the transformations they undergo. Kwan broke it down further and described Kishan Tenketsu as being marked by self-realization, understanding, and then change. <laughs> Your clothes never wear as well the next day. Your hair never falls in quite the same way. So this line might ring some bells if you've ever heard of a song called Absolutely by Nine Days. The band itself was a bit of a one-hit wonder, though they did give us those great lyrics that somehow got repurposed into talking about the multiverse. And to top it all off, the Daniels actually contacted John Hampson, the lead singer, who went on to record three custom covers with altered lyrics that play at different points in the film. No, no. 
finish the taxes. Thank you all for watching. Like I said, what a great movie, and I had a lot of fun making this one. Alright, till next time, have a great day.